Hi, it's me again, Pat Stewart, and welcome back to Ghost 101. I think this is class seven. I've kind of lost track. Anyway, this is the class on fencing and gates. All right. So the biggest problem that we have with keeping goats is keeping goats in where we want them to be because goats are curious and inventive and they find ways to get out of where we want them to be. So when we think about fencing, we generally think about beautiful whiteboard fencing, which we think about with horses. And if you go back in time and think about Little House on the Prairie, there were these, there was always the pigs in the sty. Um, the chickens were free ranging. The sheep were always staying in their nice little enclosure. Um, that was not real. <laughs> okay. Um, split rail fences are very pretty to look at. They look like they're the economical way to, to go, but they're really not. We can break fencing into three different parts. One is a permanent fence, one is a, one is a semi-permanent fence, and one is a portable fence. A permanent fence is one where you invest in an auger or rent an auger or hire somebody else to use an auger to dig a permanent fence post with a concrete footing, usually made of uh, cedar. And um, those go about every 10 feet around your perimeter of wherever you want to fence. And then if you were working in Hollywood land, you would use split rail fencing in between those with, um, little, with little cutouts called mortises where the boards would fit in. There would be an area called a tenon on the fence and it would slip into the mortise and then it would all stay there nice and neat. <clears throat> the problem with goats and especially Nigerian dwarf goats is you need to have those every six inches or maybe every four inches depending upon the age of your goat. Um, so that gets really time consuming and very material consumptive. So one way to do that, if you want to have that exterior look of a split rail fence, um, is to put up your fence. It's often done in the front yard, not so much in the back areas, but you can. <clears throat> and then put up a top and bottom rail and then attach another wire fence on the inside. Even if you use an electric fence on the inside, it, they're still going to go under the boards. They're just not going to stay in. That's the way goats are. Now, some people would tell you to tether goats. I would ask you please not to tether goats. Um, in the western part of the country, tethering is fairly common. Also in the southern part of the country. They also participate in things called goat roping competitions, which I don't really like the idea of. Um, that's where the goat stands in for a steer and you just rope him and tie him up and then let him go, but he doesn't get scared at all. <laughs> so um, when you're tethering an animal out, that just means putting them on a long chain so that they can eat around the area where they are. <clears throat> well, that's fine. If there are no dogs, foxes, coyotes, bears, mountain lions, wolves, or any other kind of predator nearby, because that goat thinks he's all alone or she, and they become paranoid. Whenever I have talked to somebody who went to a farm when they were a kid and they met a nasty goat, that was a goat who was tethered, who constantly lived in fear of attack from something. So if you were going to be out there with them, then a short-term tether, I don't think hurts anybody. But long-term tethering for hours and hours at a time is not humane and should not be used as a control system. Now, if you want to go to something very temporary, uh, there are two options. One of them is an electric fence, and the other is well, um, livestock panels. And <clears throat> livestock panels, we're going to talk a little bit more as we go along, but let's talk about electric fence right now. Um, there is such a thing as Electronet. Electronet is a system of fencing where electric carrying wires 
usually black and white, but sometimes orange, black, and white, carry uh, are twisted around with plastic, and they connect between plastic or fiberglass rods. So they're generally 150 to 300 feet long. You can put them anywhere you want to. You just stick one of those fiberglass rods in the ground. Um, the bottom line of the electronet is not charged, so it can't short out that way. Um, they're great if you want to take a big area and subdivide it. They're wonderful if you have a pasture that includes an area where maybe the goats might drown. So you could fence off an area where the bottom line would get wet and it still would not affect your, affect your electric fence. It will go over rocks without shorting out. They're really handy things to have. However, I have seen, I've witnessed this myself, um, cooperative goats. I talked last week about uh, my goats that would actually work together to open the gate. One of my customers and a friend of mine had some goats and her herd queen, the, the boss goat of the, of the three, would, she learned that hoof material does not conduct electricity. So she used her hoof and she climbed the first line down from the, up from the ground, down to the ground, the second line up from the ground, down to the ground. She accordioned the entire five or six rows of fencing so that they were all flattened down. The rest of the herd just hopped up. And then at one point, one of them came back and held the fence so she could hop out. At another point, I saw her actually hop, just, just hop right over the top. So if you're going to use an electronet like that, you need to train them to do it. And in order to train them, that means you have to teach them that touching that fence is going to electrocute them. And you have to do that before they ever learn that they can get away from it. You have to learn to teach them that that fence is always hot and they will hear the sound of the insulating rock, or the, um, the charger. They will hear that tick, 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 tick. So if that, if your charging box goes off, if your electric fence box goes off, they will know that that fence is not charged. So you have to keep the fence charged and you have to teach them by exposing them to the electric fence while it is hot. So they have to get zapped. Now that sounds terribly cruel. Let me tell you, there are two different types of fence chargers you can use. One is a high impedance fence charger and one is a low impedance fence charger. Low impedance chargers can um, handle more weed growth around them. A high impedance charge, charge box will actually short out anytime a weed touches it. Okay, so with a low impedance charger, you've got a charger that's going to put out a lower amperage. So the amount of jolt is going to be lower, but the voltage will be higher. Or Actually, it's not voltage, it's wattage will be higher. So that it goes out and it can tolerate being zapped by overgrown grass much better than a high impedance charger, which is going to put out less frequently a higher amount of electricity, a higher wattage, um, with a lower push to it. Or, um, or So I don't know how to explain it. I'm not an electrician. But anyway, the long story short is high impedance um, bo boxes, high impedance boxes will short out in overgrown grass or brush. Low impedance charges will not. And if your animal get caught, gets caught in a high impedance charge, it's going to really receive a lot of very dangerous jolts. So we all recommend a low impedance charger so that they don't get roasted, they do get shocked, but it's not as terrible a shock, okay? Now, if you wanna go beyond that Electronet, and you want to go to a full electric fence, there is a type of a permanent fence you can put into place, which is high tensile, low impedance fence charging. You need to have a professional do that for you, unless you're very good at putting in fence, because that requires a permanently set posts, because it's going to have a lot of tension on it. And 
the wire is strung extremely tight. It is strung anywhere from three wires to a fence post up to nine and 11 wires to the fence post, depending upon what type of stock you're trying to keep inside. Um, that is a very hot fence. I mean, we use low impedance, but it's designed to actually have the fence break away. If an animal, if a cow, it's designed for cows. So if a cow break busts into it, the pressure on that fence is so tight that it should break through and the cow should get bounced off by the, by the jolt. However, if you're working with goats, their little hearts are not as strong. They do not weigh as much. They are more likely to get entangled and damaged. So if you want to use a high tensile, high intent or, um, high impedance fence, I don't recommend it. Use a high tensile, low impedance fence. You won't have a problem with shorting out. You won't have a problem with injured stock and your animals will adjust to how to stay inside. Again, you'll have to teach them how to use it. I have seen very expensive fence operations with five fence lines per fence post designed for sheep, which do not work because sheep have an automatic insulator in that wool blanket. So if they touch that wool, you take a look at the high tensile fencing setup and you will see a lot of wool caught on those wires. Um, the, the sheep never feels the pain. Alpacas don't feel the pain. Goats will feel the pain, but they will learn how to jump through, how to jump over, how to crawl under, how to roll under, any way you can imagine. So you have to keep those, wi those wires seven to 11 strands per fence line and you have to keep them hot all the time. You'll need to also put a label up on every section or every two or three sections that say electric fence, because if somebody touches that, they are definitely gonna feel it. So if you're using an electric fence, you do need to label it. Regardless of what kind you're using it, you should put an electric fence sign, which are available at Tractor Supply and most farm stores. You just hang it on the fence line. Um, you can also take your split rail fence and run a single hot wire along the inside. And that will should teach your goats to stay from jumping over. It will not stop them from going under. So I think visual works really well with goats, which means giving them a visual barrier, let them see that there's something there. It doesn't have to be hot. It just needs to be not worth the trouble pushing against. So there are lots of different types of fences. I'm gonna show you and discuss as we go along the different types of fences, why some are better than others. Um, I have used snow fence. Um, I've used it to line livestock panels. I will not count on it to hold up because I have seen my goats eat it and get it down. <laughs> um, both the orange and the, the green are chewable and they won't harm the goat, except they'll go get into trouble on the outside. Most of my fencing is what I call hinge lock fencing. That has a new name now. Um, here's a picture of it. It is strong because it's got very heavy gauge wires on the horizontals. And then the verticals actually come up and are wrapped around the horizontal. So, that can slide back and forth. But when we had the ice storm about 12 years ago, and the, we lost about 85% of our fence line, but we didn't lose it permanently because once we got the trees off the fence line, we just pulled that fence back up like an accordion, tacked it back into place, and it was good to go. Um, our fence that we bought was the 30-year fence. We are now on year 23. It's looking kind of sad, but it's also been through a lot in 23 years. Um, if I had to do it again, I would make it tighter and I would still use the same stuff. Um, when I ran my fence 23 years ago, I ran it myself with another friend helping me. We did not have a fence stretcher. We did the best we could. Having a fence stretcher makes running field fence or anything easier to do. You can buy fence stretchers. Um, I fashioned one out of a piece of wood with nails sticking out of it that were the same, 
the same distance apart as the horizontal slats of my fence. So I could slip it between the fence and the inside, and then I used to come along to crank it tight. And once I got it as tight as I could get it, I then used either fencing staples or insulators, depending upon what type of fence I was doing and where I was, um, to attach it to the fence post, or in my case, I used trees. If you're going to use trees, it's best to take an insulator because you don't want your electric system, your electric operations to be right against the wood or that will short it out. Um, so I actually nail my insulators or my fence post holders or my fence holders into wood and then nail those to the tree. So as the tree grows, it pushes that block of wood out. Otherwise, as you'll see in a couple places where I got lazy, the tree grows over that. And then you have a permanent installed fence, but if you ever want to cut that tree, you have problems. Okay? So it's a good idea to use a block when using a tree. Um, the fence stretchers, even if you're buying a fence stretcher, it's still going to have a come along on it. You want to get those fences as tight as you can, because if they start to sag, if they lean in or they lean out, especially if they lean out, the goats just look at that as a challenge. It's, it's a staircase and they climb right out like a ladder. Um, if they lean in, they're more likely to try and push them down. They'll get their feet on the top and just push it down. So you want your fence to be as straight up and down as tight as you can get it. Okay. Um, I love my T fence, my, uh, my hinge lock fence. I have now seen it with different names. I believe one is Keating fencing. Um, but if you look around at different fence suppliers, um, Tractor Supply doesn't carry it. Wellscroft in New Hampshire used to carry it. Um, Diamond carries it. Uh, it's just, it's a very different type of fence attachment. So they're easy to tell from other fences. Then you have what's called the no climb fence. And the no climb fence is where the slots, the spaces are so small that a hoof can't get in there. Um, they work, but you have to keep them straight up and down because otherwise Nigerian dwarf hoofs are not very big and they can get in there. Um, no climb fences were designed for horses, but they come in sheep, goat, and horse size. Go at least goat and horse size. Do not go to just sheep height, even for Nigerian dwarf goats. Your heights, your fence heights should be at least four, preferably five to six feet high. Mine are about four and a half feet. And if my fences are tight, they stay in. If my fences aren't tight, they climb out. The nice thing about my goats is if they climb out, they just want to go back in. I'm not that even, there's not that much interest around here for them to go exploring. They are too fearful of them will go right back to the barn. So that's my advantage living here. Now, if you're going to go with something like a no climb fence, you have two options in the way the fences are attached. And although I recommend this type of fence, I could not find any on my property. I'm sure they exist here. I just could not find them. <laughs> I prefer woven wire. Woven wire is um, where your upright and your, your horizontals are not welded together. They, they're affixed by tension and literally by weaving, okay? The other type that you will commonly see is a welded wire fence. And welded wire fences, you have the horizontals going this way, and then you have a layer of verticals going up, and that is welded at the intersection. Those welds break. Oftentimes when those welds break, they break the wire along with them, so that you then wind up with very sharp uprights getting ready to stab somebody in the eye. So that's why I don't recommend welded wire. Um, it is the cheapest to find. It's fine to use for a short term, but I would not count on it for even a five year term of length of, of, of life. I would anticipate it breaking within the first year. Okay, then we come to livestock panels, which are my, my favorite type of fencing around here. Um, livestock panels come in three different sizes. They come in 30 in 16 foot lengths. Um, you can have them delivered from most um, farm supplies 
Uh, or you can rent a tractor or a trailer, or a truck or a trailer to bring them home if you want to deal with the full 16 foot length. Do not do as I did when I first bought them, which was I lashed the front, my front bumper to the one end and I went up over the top of my minivan band, and with it all bowed down, I then tied the back part of my lash dark panels to my back bumper and I drove all the way home from Hillsborough, New Hampshire to Ashburnham, about an hour like that. That was not wise. I would not do it again. Now, when I buy my 16 foot stuff, I bring my bolt cutters with me and I cut them into eight foot lengths. And then that's easier to handle on a flatbed trailer. But if you go to Hardwick Supply or you go to some other farm places, they will deliver them to you for a small fee, which is worth paying. Now, the panels themselves come in three different types. Yeah. One is your cattle panel. Cattle panels, and I'll put a picture of it here. Um, those have a very nice wide space to cut down the amount of metal in the fence to make it not so heavy. However, it is the perfect size for a goat to get out, especially a goat kid. Then you have hog panels. Hog panels are smaller. They're less than three feet tall, but they are a much thicker gauge wire. Um, they will work if your goats never realize that they're there. <laughs> I have successfully used them for two years on one, one fence and nobody figured out they could hop out because the other two walls were, were taller than that. So they just assumed that all fencing was that same height. They were not the smartest goats, but it worked for us. Um, they are very heavy. They also come in 16 foot lengths. Um, they're very handy to have around, especially if, if you have hogs, um, but they are not trustworthy unless you want to stack them. You can take one and put it, to the, put it on, attach it to it upright in some way, and then put another one on top of that and attach that. So if you've got a five foot tall fence post, you can use two combo, two hog panels to make it um, look like it's a five foot long or six foot high fence. Just do yourself a favor and use either Rolex wire or electric fence wire and attach the top and bottoms together. So you don't wind up with an animal getting its leg caught between those two and it sprung open, their foot slipped and now their leg is stuck inside this fence or their, God forbid, their neck is stuck. So definitely attach that every six to about every six to eight inches so that they don't get in that trouble. Okay. The other is the combination panel and a combo panel is made up of, it's the same height as a cattle panel, but it has gradated, has graduated um, hole sizes. So now near the bottom, the holes are about two and a half inches tall and six inches wide. Um, then you go about half another one or two courses of that height and it gets to be three to four inches high and the same width. And then you get to the cattle section, which is six, six to eight inches. Um, those will hold most goat kids over the age of three months old but do not count on them to hold baby babies in. So um, that's why, that's when I use the snow fence. I line the inside and I do make it the inside so that they can't get trapped. Um, the snow fence, they will not chew on. In my case, when I did it, the mothers chewed off the tops, but by the time the mothers figured that out, it wasn't the mothers we were worried about, it was the babies and the babies had grown so big that they couldn't get out anymore. When you're doing the fencing, you have to be very creative. Um, it is likely around here you will find things tied up with electric, with um, baling twine. Don't do that. I have somebody in my household who loves to do baling twine. And baling twine is fine for many occasions, but if it's going to test a goat, it's going to lose. Use um, either Romex wire or use electric fence wire. 
There is a tool which is very handy called a fencing claw or a fencing tool. Um, and that is set up so that it has a claw to hold, pull out fencing posts or fencing staples. And it has a hammerhead on the other side. Um, so it can actually whack things in. It has a wire cutter on the inside. Some of them have even more elaborate gadgets. Um, it is works like a pliers. It can also be used like pliers. They're very handy things to have. Um, if you've got a pair of work jeans and you've got what I call camers, the loops, those were designed for hammers. The right size camer will also work for a fencing tool. When you're working fencing, they are, in, they are invaluable. The thing about, regardless of what fencing you're using, you have to look at what kind of post you're using. Um, as I said, I use a lot of trees around here because that's what I had. Um, and that those trees have pretty much held up over 23 years. They haven't taken any trees down that had fencing attached. And I haven't had, I had one tree die and that tree was probably sick when I started it. Um, but in, when, when we use a fence post, we tend to use a T fence post, not a U post. There are two different types of them. T posts are stronger. They are harder to put in. They're not so much more difficult on the pushing part. They're more difficult to hold on to. So whenever you're working fencing, you should wear a good pair of gloves, preferably leather, but it's up to you. Um, you can use a sledgehammer to put them in, or you can use a double-handed fence sinker, which is actually weighted. If you get a really nice one, they're spring-loaded. They make it so much easier to drive the fence post in. Um, our land is pretty much ledge, so we are not as flexible as where we put our fencing as some people would be. We know exactly where God wants them to be because that's where the fence post goes in. But if you use a U-fence post, it's a lighter weight metal. It's galvanized. It's shaped like a U. It comes out, has flanges on the side. It comes together in a U here. The top of those flanges often bend off when you're sinking the fence post. That's one reason we like the T fences, the T posts. Um, they usually have fins up the side so you can step those posts in. You can step them in up to a point and then you will have to use either um, a fence setter or a, um, a hammer to knock them back further down to the ground. You should have them at least sunk so the fins are all the way down, if not further. U posts are not as strong, so they're much more likely to bend under the pressure of the goats. So the more you can get into the ground, the stronger your post will be. The T posts are actually, they're steel, but they are a thicker steel, almost like an iron. Um, and so those are harder for them to bend, but they have little knobs on them. The knobs on the sides are to help hold the fencing in place, um, but they make it very hard on your hands to hold. So you can often step those up to a point and then you have to use some kind of a fence sinker to sink the post all the way in. But the T posts are easier to attach things to because they don't bend at the top. Um, there are, you can find different adapters for your electric fence. If you're going to put electric fence up, if you're going to put wire fence up, um, if you're using a T post, you'll get, you can buy them at farm supplies. It's like a V shape that has two little arms over it. The arms hook on the, over the inside of the fence. The V shape goes on the outside of the fence so that it is permanently attached or semi-permanently attached and you pinch those little extensions closed and then that fence can't slide because there are all those little bumps on the side that hold that fencing in place. With U-fencing, um, you buy a U, a plastic insulator, which is set up for U-posts. They often are triangular as well, but sometimes they're, they're semicircular. You have to spring those open a little bit if, if, to get onto the U-post if the top has flared out too much. So um, 
once you got those in place, you can attach your fencing to it. You can attach your electric fence to it. Um, they're very handy to have. There are other types. You can use something along the lines of your Electronet that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Electronet actually comes with, uh, you can buy additional fiberglass rods. So if for some reason you've got a section, like on my property, there's 10 feet between sections, but I'm going to have a change of grade within that 10 feet. So I want to keep it high as much as I can. If I just let that fence, post, that electric fence, fence um, collapse down on itself, it's going to short itself out. So what I do is, as before I get to the drop out, uh, drop off, I put another uh, fiberglass rod that has a little clip on it to hold the wire in place, and then I can hold that fence up with with the electric fence that holds it in the shape that I want it to be in, and then the clip at the top will hold the fence at the height that I want it to be in. And then when I move down to the next level, it's not. It is assuming that it's going from this height, not this height, okay? I don't really know how to explain it to you better than that without being out there, and I don't have anything set up for it right now. But having that type of fence or having the step-in fences, which you can find fiberglass rods that have um, holes, long slots, they will give you a lot of the same flexibility. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of fencing. The big thing right now is you need to remember low impedance if you're doing with electric. Not much too not too much space, regardless of what fence you're using. Then we come into the gates. You can make a gate out of a flap of a flap of woven wire fence or welded wire fence, um, and it will hold up, but it will bend and it will not be very attractive. It's a very good short-term situation. It's very functional. Um, however, in my experience, it tends to get lost. She's like, where is that break in the fence? And if it's not attached properly, then the goats will just use that open flap to get out. So you should make a self-contained gate. And what, makes a self-contained gate st strong are corner braces. If you do not use corner braces, your fence gate will be very wobbly and the goats will tear it apart very quickly. Um, if you put a, another horizontal halfway through, that will give it some support, but because it's not natural to have a right angle, triangles are always stronger um, um, geometrically, it's best to take another piece of wood and go, whether it's a wedge or just a straight board, miter it off so that you've got a triangular shape here. And then when that fence starts to wobble, it has to move all three sides, not just two. All right. So when you're building those gates, make sure to reinforce those those corners. Don't rely on just an L bracket to do that. L brackets will break. They will twist. Take that extra time to do that third edge. Um, here's a picture of one of our fences, the, our gates that we use on the inside for our kidding pens. Um, it does not have the corner braces, but it has so much wood structure to it that it may as well. Most gates are not like this. Um, this gate has wood not wood on the bottom to keep draft off the babies. Um, if we weren't concerned about draft, that would all be hardware cloth. And we would be doing more reinforcement in the corners. Okay? When you're building your gates, you have to not only think about the gate itself, but also how it's going to be sitting in to the space. Um, if you do not build it so that there is a stretcher along the bottom, you are going to have your corners, your edges of the gates start to splay. They're going to rock back and forth. Um, you will eventually have one side just drifting off this way. You have to tie it together. Um, it's a struggle that we run into all the time. Um, the problem with doing that type of a fence is getting a wheelbarrow over there can sometimes be a problem. So 
when you're making that bottom part of your gate opening, think about how much you're going to have to step over. And maybe you want to use something metal that partly sinks in the ground. It will be damaged by the wood, but it's not going to rust out in a year. Um, but if you don't have that, then you don't have the continuity of the fence line and the strength is just not there. Um, also, you want to make sure that your hinged section is attached to something solid. Do not just assume that you can wire it on to the T post or the U post, if that's what you're going to use for fencing. It certainly will not work if you're just using a, um, a livestock panel. The nice thing about livestock panels in temporary fencing is you can make a temporary pen and just clip them together with either dog leashes or uh, um, carabiners or Romex wires. You can make portable fences all over the place with um, livestock panels. But if you're going to use them as part of a gate system, they have to be attached to a solid object. Um, do not just try to hinge onto that. It's too flimsy. All right. So the other part of your gate are your latches. And I took some pictures of the latches at my farm. Um, these are the latches on the kid pens, and you'll see that there are some at top and bottom, and they are attached by a wire. It's even better if they're attached by a um, fine chain. It doesn't have to be a super fine chain, and certainly shouldn't be a heavy chain, but a chain that will carry, if you lift one up to open up one latch, you will then open up the bottom latch. But if you close one, you will close the other one too. Um, I have does that will, and I, not just mine, I've seen other people do it too. They paw and paw and paw at that bottom one and they'll open that one up. And once that one's open, the top one's fairly easy to open. Um, also they can get their, either their hooves, their legs caught or their, the baby's hooves caught in that open gate, which then closes on them. So it's best to have a latch on top and bottom and it's easier if there's some type of whether it's um, a wire in my case or a chain, don't use a string because that will break. Um, might be able to use a leather thong, but a goat would eat through that too. So I've seen some really nice chains um, that are appealing to look at. They're not too chunky. They're flexible enough to be able to, to handle life in the barn, but they're strong enough to be able to, to move the latches simultaneously, okay? This is a goat proof latch. They are not goat proof. This is a goat proof latch, which I have done better at making goat proof. I talked last week about mudslide opening up a gate. This is the gate she used to open. And this is the horse latch. A horse latch, especially one that's got an inset so you can lock it is like a foolproof way. They are very heavy. They are hard for Nigerian dwarf goats. They're hard for almost any goat to open. I have seen horses open them, so I don't put it past a buck to know how to do it. But if you have it so that it that lower loop comes down and fits around a an eye hook, then you can just clip a dog leash or a carabine or two, then that's another step you have to remove but it's also a very important step to keep them, they will not be able to remove it and they will not get out that way, okay? So um, the other big problem with fencing that people run into is the corners. Um, I cannot recommend Gail Damero's book more than I already do. Um, she talks very much about the type of corner, corner stabilizations um, whether you use a mule, which is not an equine, a mule is something that is a tether to the outside, maybe to tether to a tree, um, or you use a triangle on the inside of the fence to reinforce it. Um, but the corners are the weakest part of a fence. They're even weaker than the gate because that the gate is in place, 
then that's a continuous line. The corner, you just automatically, it wants to fold. So you need to find a way, and if it's on a fence post, and it's not high tensile, maybe that's going to be enough. But most of us find that reinforcing that with a mule, and I will get a picture of a mule up in just a minute, then you can really keep that fence tight and long lasting. Okay. So how much fencing do you need? Depends upon how many goats you want to have. Um, I would recommend if you can do 20 by 20 for two or three, 10 by 20, 10 is enough, but 20 by 20 is better. Um, I could have kept my five goats. We had our first house was just over a quarter acre. And if I had not been in the urban zone of the town, I could have kept my two sheep and my three goats on that property easily and given them room to wander, plenty of food and exercise. But I lived in the wrong zone, so I couldn't do that. Um, but a 20 by 20 space is a good place to start. And it's always nice to be able to have it subdivided. So what we did was we built our first fencing. It was about 25 by 25 square with one wall being the barn. And then at that time we had five goats. Once we got to 12 goats, we extended that out another twice as long. And then we went at another 30 feet out. And then we went another 30 feet beyond that. So we just keep on moving it further and further out. Um, they always have the original land to work to get to. So everybody's always enclosed. But we try to give them new, new pasture on, to be on every year or two. Um, I need to do more of that. But that's trying to figure out how much fencing you need. That's your good rule of thumb. Um, in different parts of the country, there are different fencing contractors. Depending on how ambitious you feel, you may actually want to just hire somebody to do that for you. But it's up to you. Um, if they're just pets, it doesn't need to be rocket science. But you do need to be smarter than a goat. So test whatever you're doing. And good luck. And be prepared to be tested because they will do it. Okay? Have a great week. I'll see you next time. Okay? Bye.